All I can say is, praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. We certainly would like to thank the participants for today, especially the ones who braved it out, come here and read. Thank you, um, David and uh, Terry. Also like to thank the, our visitors, beautiful song, uh, the, the Spring Valley Academy, under the directorship of Miss Doria. Thank you so much for providing the beautiful song, uplifting song. Shall we pray? Father God, thank you for being here through your spirit. Help us, Lord, to sense it. And Father God, hide me behind you that your children today will hear your voice, will hear your message. Hide me, Lord. I'm just an ordinary, sinful being. But Lord, we trust you that you will grant our prayer today. In Jesus' name. We are at the end of this year, December. And you know what goes on. The seasons are starting to re be rejuvenated for the celebration. But we all know that we are celebrating not a day, not even a tradition, but the birth and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And that should be the essence of our celebration as we think of these days approaching this coming season. And also, I would like us to reflect on something that would allow us to realize and know who we are. The title of a message today is, Whose People Are We? Now I'd like to personalize it more. I'd like to personalize it more. Do you know who you are? Again, I'd like to repeat it. Do you know who you are. Let that sink in. And what is the narrative of our lives? As we started this year, January up to now, what is the narrative? What has been the narrative of your life, of my life? That is the thing that I like to present to you today. If you, somebody would ask you, do you know who you are? What would be your response? Well, I am Joe. I am Tony. Maybe you would say, I'm married. I'm a Christian. I'm a teacher. I'm a physician, and I'm retired even, and some of you probably wish, I wish I was retired. Man defines themselves with what they do. Maybe you will meet a guy, you know, hey man, what do you do? Well, I just watch football games. Have you been following in the NFL? Yeah, man, yeah. Let's go fishing. You know, let's enjoy fishing. How about a woman? What do you think they would be discussing about? Hmm. Soap opera? Miss Universe? My looks? The cares? They talk. We define ourselves by who we are 
and what we do and who we relate to. And oftentimes with what we have and what we have not. Now this world defines each other with what they have. Most commonly, you know, what we have and what we have not. What do we have? Talents, abilities, maybe you would say money. That's what the world looks at. How about our accomplishments? What we have done? We measure ourselves in those ways. And it's all about what we do. Isn't it? Listen to this. But when we stand before God, does that really matter? What we have done the rest of our lives? May I repeat it? If we stand before God, does it really matter what we have done in our lives? Yes, we would be working, that's important, because we have to earn, we have to pay bills. Working is noble. Some would even define themselves with the success that they had got. You know what, in this society, what we almost want to achieve is success. Maybe that's not bad. We earn, we work so hard for success. And at the end, I'd like to draw you back to this scenario in the Bible. After working so hard to accomplish something for your life in this earth, reflect back on this chapter in the Bible. Jesus confronted the people or somebody else. And Jesus said to them, Depart from me, I never knew you. So no matter how hard we work, no matter how much money we have made, no matter how good we are, it doesn't matter to God. Remember the rich young Euler who approached Jesus Christ? I did this, I did that, I went to church, I paid tithe, I did everything, Lord. And Jesus stated something that touched him, or maybe not. And he departed lonely. Also Nicodemus, same thing. So all these things, what we are doing in life, does it really define us? It doesn't. Today, I'd like to talk to you about what the Bible says about who you are and who we are. Let us put it this way. If you define yourself by the world's ways, listen, if you define yourselves by the world's ways, you will come up always short. You will come out always short. Why is that? Because we define it by way, the way what we see. We define it by, by the way how we perceive things. And second to that, we have to consider God's ways. That's why you always come up short. And we discover that what matters to God is more important to what matters to anyone else in this world. And even to ourselves. So, at some point in time, we have to decide what matters to God? 
at some point in time, we have to decide what really matters to God. How does God define me or you? Does God define you with the abilities you possess? No. Does he define you with the things that you accomplished and, and stored in your whatever your storage you have? No. If we tend to think, and we tend to think of accomplishing greater things by ourselves, right? All the big things that we like to do in life. And yet, and yet, we tend to ignore a child's simple faith. You'll be amazed just that what did not matter to God matters to our smallest, most. So, in our text this morning, which is found in 1 Peter 2.9. I'd like you to really look at this. Let's start. 1 Peter 2.9. But ye are a chosen generation. Did you hear that? You are a chosen generation. Now let's go back, okay, to Ephesians 1. What does it say there? Ephesians 1. I lost my marker. Ephesians 1. Verse 4. According as he hath, what does it say? Chosen us, you, in him. When did he chose you? Before the foundation of this world. Now, did he chose you when you come up running to him during your, like, when you had a Bible study and then you had this baptism? Did he chose you when you first prayed to God and and earnestly sought him? No. When did he first chose you? Before the foundation of this world. He chose us for him. So, he chose us. From the very beginning of time. Let's continue. First Peter two nine. He chose you as his own generation. In other words, he picked you. You know? Talking about picking. Forgive me, Amy, for doing this, but when I was courting my wife and finally got married, I did this courtship thing. And you know what? When he finally said yes, she, I'm sorry, I'm a Filipino. She picked me, picked me from probably a lot of guys. She picked me. And you know what that did to me? Oh, boy, you can just imagine. Now I was floating in cloud nine or maybe hundreds of clouds over there. I was so happy. You can't even describe it. Or about, is Andrew here? Andrew. Hey, when your class picked you as a class president, what did you feel? I was good. Yeah. 
Yes. There was a lot of people, young people out there, hundreds of them, but they picked you. Is that amazing? How about us as God's children? He picked you. He picked me. A chosen generation. So let's go on. How about maybe some illustrations? How many, how many of you are working here, right? And how many of you were picked to receive a promotion, a race? I have a story to tell a little bit from my relatives, Amy's relatives back in California. Her, the wife of his, her uncle, got a race. And, you know, they were so happy. And what they did, you know, and this is a good thing. She spent maybe a large portion of that money to buy a lot of things and got the whole the family, had a party, and then gave it out. Gave out that blessing. That's a wonderful thing. So being picked creates a lot of good things in your own self. So here's God, the creator of all universe, coming down in this earth and picking us, picking you. Now listen. Listen to this. When God chose us, did he come to you and say, hey, come on, come on, big guy. You are of great value. You can help me. You know, you've got these accomplishments and talents. You can help me. Come on, join me. Is that what he said? What was his, what were our, our condition? Romans 5, 6. Let's turn to Romans 5, 6 and see what it is. God chose us not because we are wonderful people. What does it say in Romans 5, 6? When God chose to bring, to send his son to die on the cross, it says here, for when we are yet without strength or sinners in due time, Christ died for us. And what's the word there? Ungodly. Maybe you can just create a lot of imaginations of what an ungodly is. And that's me. That's you. We are sinners. And verse 10. When we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. So that's what our condition was when the great creator of the universe came down and chose you. It didn't really matter who you are, what were your background, what were your condition. He just plainly chose you to be his. Before even ever in our life we have done anything right or wrong, he chose us. Let's go some tracking back here in Deuteronomy 7.6. Because you will discover that this same proclamation was said of Israel, right? Deuteronomy 7, verse 6. This is God addressing the Israelites, okay? What he says, the same plain words. For thou art an holy nation unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath what? chosen thee, Israel, to be a special people unto himself and above all people that are upon the face of the earth. In his idea of time, God came down and chose Israel. What do you think the condition of Israel during the time? Were they a big nation? No. 
Were they a righteous, good, performing nation? No. There's a lot of big nations out there, powerful nations. But why did God chose Israel to be his special people, even declaring them holy? Even Abraham. You know Abraham, right? He called Abraham, Abraham. Okay? Is there any record in the Bible that Abraham was a special man? Was a special guy? Accomplished? You know? No. He was a plain, simple man like you and me. See, see how God thinks in his mind. We can't even fathom. And oftentimes we think that we are gods thinking for ourselves. Listen to this. Israel and Abraham became special people because what? They were chosen. Okay? In other words, they were not special people. That's why they were chosen. Did you hear that? They became special people because God chose them. And not the other way around. And if you come to think about that, that God does that, isn't that that it removes all the responsibility from us? Right? And puts all the responsibility on God because He was the one who did the choosing. So just like a family, God loved whom He chose. And we have our own family, right? Do we love our family? Of course we do. We love our kids. We treasure them because they are ours. They are, they are ours. They are mine. Just the same thing with God. When he chose this people, Israel, his people, he considered them as their family. He treasured them. That is what God intends for us. Because we did not choose him. He chose us. So let's go proceed on the starting point of our text. A chosen nation. Let's go back. First Peter. A chosen generation, special people. And listen to this. We know that Israel was chosen because they were not the best. They were chosen by God. What? Let's, let's read this. Um, in God chose Israel to bless the world. And not only that, there's one point I'd like to share with you. God chose Israel to bring who? One man. Who is that one man? He chose Israel to bring one man, Jesus Christ, his only son, an Israelite born of David, to bless the world. So that all who come to Christ will be his own. So think about that. That God considers each one of you as his chosen, a special people, his family. Not because of who you are or what you did, but because of what he is, a God of love. So it's not about you. It's not about me. It's about our God. And second, a royal priesthood. 
Not only he chose you. See, royal priesthood. What is royalty? You know, maybe in the news you've been following about Harry and, who's that lady? Miss Megan? Yeah. This person get, get, getting married, and it's a royal wedding. Do you think everybody can come on that royal wedding? Mm -mm. Royal family. A priesthood. What is a priesthood? What is a priest? You think everybody during that time, anybody can enter the temple to conduct the priesthood work? No. Remember when a priest would go down to the most holy place? You know, to offer the offering, because that is a sacred place, and nobody can go there. The priest would wear this, what? This robe with some bells in it. Because if something happens, like if the priest hadn't really prepared himself, and if he has some sin in his heart, what would happen to the priest? He would die. And the people would just be pulling. Oh, there's no more ringing a bell. Hmm. Looks like a priest didn't make it. So they're going to pull him out. Those are two entities that God held in his hand, a royalty and a priesthoodness. And what? What did he do? He gave it to you, a royal priesthood. And what does that mean to us? It means that Jesus, Jesus allowed us to cut into their circle. We got the belongingness here, a family, right? So whereas before it was limited, now we can come in the presence of God through Jesus Christ. So he picked us, he chose us. That is a status that put us on an elevated ground, higher than what we are. That's belongingness. Is it important that we have a sense of belongingness? Let me ask you this. Maybe putting you in a spot. How many of you, or those who have been coming here and for the first time, felt a belongingness in this church? Did you feel belong? Or do you feel belong? How would you imagine that if I enter a room and then there's a lot of people there, you know, one group here and one group there chatting on their own, unmindful of everything. And there's a computer there with a password and I don't even know the password. I would like to go into that. I can't access anything and people doesn't talk to me. What do you feel? Probably you just want to get out of the place because you don't have the sense of belongingness and acceptance. But we as God's children, have been held together by Jesus Christ so that we can belong to that family of God. A belongingness that you should have experienced. Now, you know, in my notes, how is it that as a church, we can find belongingness, acceptance, and some people would use the word tolerance. As a family, that you what? That you put up with. Hmm. You know in a family? They are family, but you know, we're not perfect family, and you put up with them. <laughs> Why? You resolve king things, but you put up with them because of the differences. But you're a family, you know? Some would say, hmm, don't, don't even touch my family. Don't even mess up with them. Okay? Because they are my family. They are precious to me. They have a value to me. Now, in my notes, maybe this would need another topic or a message. The union of churches as a family is kind of like has to be defined. Of course, we accept each other, right? Because we all believe in Jesus. We are all believers in Jesus. What I'm talking about is 
how as a church we have to hurdle or handle an ecumenical unification of churches. Maybe that's a heavy word for, for, for some. That is based on common good. You know? You know what happened October 31, 2017? That the whole Christian church, Protestant church, as a whole, has already uni unified with Catholics, and now they're one. When we say belongingness and being one, all of us believe in Jesus Christ. Do you agree with me? It doesn't end there. Because if you believe in Jesus Christ and would like to be a believer and follow him, what would you do? If there's a certain rule at home, and you would like to belong in the family, there are rules, right? You have to follow. So, in that aspect, I leave it at that. But in our church, we have to have belongingness. Because the worst thing is, somebody comes up here, enters our door, and nobody even cares for him or her, and would have that sense of belongingness and wouldn't come back. So, that's important thing in our experience, to find belongingness in this fellowship of ours. So, in, let's go back again, First Peter 2, 9, we are chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and the next is you have been set apart. Okay. It says here, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. A holy nation. God is holy, therefore, you have to be holy. We are called holy ones because we are not just chosen ones, we are not just part of the family, we are holy ones. Holy. Hmm. It, it just gives me a little bit of. of an easiness here. Do you mean I'm holy? I'm not holy. You're not holy. Because we sin, right? First John. First John says, He that says he is without sin is what? A liar. And the truth is not in him. So, if you look at this, the point of being holy is not that you're without sin. It's that you're specially set apart for a purpose. Okay? So, that part of being set apart is you live unto God. You live for something, a special purpose. You're a part of Him. You share his character by God's grace. And he lives in you. And by his grace, through the faith, the Spirit of God work, would work in your lives. And that's how you live a holy life. It is by, by God's grace. So he picked you. He let you in. He set you apart. And he has an intention, every intention to put his character in you so that you and I can demonstrate God's character in this world. So the question is, are people around you seeing God's character? At work, at home, in your neighborhood? 
What is the character of God that they see? Is it the holiness of God that they see? Fourth, God wants to show us off. Imagine that. God wants to show us off. As we continue on, to show forth his praises. So we are his possessions, okay? So we are God's people, a people belonging to God, his own, his very own. It came with a big price. His ownership of us came with a big price. His son dying on the cross. But you know, sometimes we have the audacity of thinking that we own God. You know, when we come to him, I want this, I want that. In our prayers even, we think God is like a vending on ATM. You know, in ATM, you put your dollar there, and what comes out? The money. Or in a vending machine, you put your dollar there or cents. What comes up? Some, some you know, cookies. Spontaneous. It caters to your needs. How about God? How about when we pray to God? Do, you, do, do we pray to God as if like, Oh Lord, I'm encountering this problem. I need this. I need that. Please Lord, give it to me. Please. Even perhaps, you know, you know that genie in the lamp? You rub the lamp, and then one comes up. The genie, oh, you, know, you would imagine, Master, what can I do for you? That's not what it is. You don't go to God and say, you belong to me, and this is what I want. But often we do that. God owns us, and we belong to him. Jesus picked us. He let us in, set us apart. He would like to show us off. God picked you out, and he has you in his heart forever. He loves you because you're special. So look at your kids. Do you feel special? I would like, you know, maybe an exercise because you've been so, like, quiet down there. Look around before, beside you and tell your friends, you're special. You're special. Come on, you're special. Okay? Does it make us happy and feeling good inside that we're special? And one more thing. We are God's inheritance. We are God's inheritance. You would say, me, you? God's inheritance, you know? Nothing much in me. Why would, why would I be God's inheritance? There's nothing much in me. You know, when we, when we talk about inheritance, you know, in this earthly world that we are in, before transitioning to heaven, what do we do? Oh, we are so busy gathering, you know, for our retirement, you know? <laughs> if possible, putting every, bumping our account. Because we would like to prepare for that retirement. Which, tell you, should not be the passion of our existence in this world. So you are inheritance. God's inheritance. And looking at yourself, I'm nothing, Lord. Why would I be an inheritance? Listen to this. Why wouldn't you be God's inheritance? He poured everything he had for you. He gave his son to die on the cross for you. He gave his spirit to live in you. And he selected you. He chose you. He let you in. And he is, and we are his possessions. And he said, I own you. Do you like to hear that word? God owns you and me. He owns us. Therefore, he'll protect us. He'll preserve us his own. You have a family, you have a home. You do your very best to protect your home and your family. How much more with God, who is our universe, who is the ruler of the universe? And lastly, I forget this. This, this should, 
emote a wow sensation in us, right? right? A wow, wow, God owns me, God possesses me. Why would I doubt myself now, even I'm in this kind of condition? Lastly, the text says, You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Peculiar people, not of this world. That he should show you forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. So, he created, God created us for a purpose, for a reason. So that purpose is that, to give glory to him. So, who am I, listen, who am I defines why I am here. Did you get that? Who am I defines why you and me. We are here. If you are here, listen, if you are here, is the work you do in this world, no wonder you are depressed. If you are here, and it's defined by the activity you live every day, even in this life, you are not to be doing well. But if you say, and believe you are here, you are chosen, you belong to God, you are a royal priesthood, you are a family, you are holy, you are His prized possession, then it sets up your whole purpose for being here. Until we understand that we are made of God, made for Him, you will never understand life. You will never understand why you have troubles. You will never understand why you go through things until you understand who you are and why you are here. As we go on in life, We define life as our, our identity. Actually, we are, we, are, we are looking at our identity. Who you are defines why you're here. In other words, your identity leads to your destiny. And don't let Satan rob you of your, of your identity and destiny. So if you know you are in Christ, everything in your life will change. And will be aligned with God's purpose and make it more meaningful. You have a purpose for God's glory. So, if you just cuddle around and vacillate in this world by yourself, and just go along in that get it by attitude with your friends, with your neighbors, with everybody you, 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 you group with. And try to make this world an end to its means. You will end up with a life that is worthless. If you are so contracted in your vision, in your mind, that what you see is only the happenings, activities of this world, the demands of this world, and not your very purpose to glorify God, then you will, your, your life will end worthless. But if you say and believe and experience it, that I am a child of a king, that I am chosen, that I am holy, that I am set apart, that I am God's possession. He owns me. I have a purpose, and that purpose is for Him to live. Then 
and only then you will have fulfilled your purpose and great reward will be with you or awaiting for you in heaven and most importantly and most importantly Jesus our Savior will be waiting out there to welcome and receive his family and to usher you in his kingdom which he had prepared for you and me and the uttermost purpose we have a privilege we will have and we don't want to miss that is to give glory to our God the Father in heaven so to this end find who you are who really who you are find it and live like it find it find who you are and live like it and live it for him for his glory